Either dedicated committees uh, of the two houses or the one suggestion put forward, of course, is a joint committee um, to oversee what's going on. And that would probably be quite a sensible way forward because it would allow both houses to play to their strengths um, and be quite efficient in terms of resources. I think essentially it's done through treaty negotiators, in effect it's, it's a prerogative power. So there will be primary legislation required, but that's likely to be later on. But at that point it could be quite substantial in terms of having to take a lot of uh, law off the statute book. So um, it depends what's identified as to whether one needs a series of measures, some rather omnibus measure or several omnibus measures, um, to do that. So it may be that in terms of legislation, you start off very quietly because there's very little to be done and then it becomes quite a massive exercise. It would depend to what extent you needed to amend it so that the sort of the heavy lifting comes subsequent to that um, because you'd probably need a measure that left European law in place until such time as you decided what needed to be removed from the statute book rather than simply get everything off, uh, 40 years of European law off the statute book, uh, which would be a recipe for chaos. The Constitution Committee of the House of Lords regularly reports when there's uh, use of Henry VIII powers and whether appropriate or not might be giving too much power uh, to government and given that you've got um, an exercise in government of identifying those laws that are repealed. I don't see why you can't have a measure uh, that, that, that specifies them and so it's quite clear as to what has been um, done away with. There is a complication in terms of devolution um, but ultimately um, Parliament uh, can pass legislation that applies to the, the United Kingdom. So it could, if necessary, override existing legislation. Formally, of course, parliamentary sovereignty has always been uh, there. Um, the reason European law takes precedence over domestic law is because Parliament says it uh, should. So it's Parliament itself that's prescribed that dominance. Um, so formally the doctrine uh, remains extant, formally in domestic law parliament to repeal at any point the European Communities Act. Um, and there's also a separate issue uh, over the, you know, the volume of law that is made in Brussels. So during the campaign various suggestions were made, well X percentage of our laws are made in Brussels. Um, and it's not quite so simple to say, you know, 50% or 60%, uh, because it depends whether you're including primary legislation, secondary legislation, what, uh, to what extent you're including the directives, the regulations. If you're including those, are you including all of them or only those that are extant? Um, of those that are extant, are you ex including or excluding those that have no application for anybody in the United Kingdom? It might only affect Italian olive growers or something. So it's an extraordinarily difficult task to establish. Um, just the volume of uh, law that derives uh, from Brussels. But ultimately, as I say, the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty has always been there because the only reason Brussels is seen as, as is able to do what it's been able to do is because Parliament says it. Uh, Parliament, by enacting the European Communities Act, has provided the means in domestic law for that to happen. <laughs>